Okay. All right. So first of all, I want to um, correct a mistake. Um, uh, I'll call it a small mistake. A typo in uh, what I did last time. So let me fix that first. And um, then I got an email back from the authors. Uh, oh, this is from this book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so first of all, it was a bit of a sign confusion. The, um, the Callan's Emancic equation, depending on what nomenclature we use, it's d by d log a plus dg d log a partial partial d of some physical thing. And this means, this is just the statement that DDA, uh, or that A, DDA of P of A, G of A is zero. And of course, that's what we want. We don't want the value of the physical parameter, the physical uh, uh, observable to vary as we change the lattice spacing. And uh, so the sign convention is beta of g is minus dg. This is the beta function. And then, of course, the, 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 this thing becomes 0 is partial partial log a minus beta dg of uh, p is 0. All right, is that, that's that. Then there was another. Uh, typo here, we, we get that A of G, so I'm skipping ahead from what I did last time, A of G is um, effectively some A0 times beta 1 plus beta 0 over G squared to the beta 1 over 2 beta 0 squared, and then the crucial term, God, e to the minus 1 over 2 beta 0 g squared. I call this the crucial term because as we let the coupling go to 0, this, is a, this term has an essential singularity of g equals 0, and it shoves the lattice spacing to 0 lying uh, uh, nobody's business really, really fast. It overwhelms this factor here. Um, when you invert this, oh, let me, let me say uh, what, what the response of Lang and, what is what's the other name? Gatringer was. First of all, they were not, they were neglecting this term completely because they wanted something simple. And what and so what they uh, do is they go a zero. God, I'm talking like a teenager. So sorry about that. Okay, so this is approximately that. And uh, then what they do is they introduce, they replace a zero with a lambda lattice and call this beta zero g squared to the minus beta one over two beta zero squared e to the minus one over two beta zero g squared. So they what one, one they they basically taken a they they in other words lambda lattice differs from a zero by a power of beta zero but it's just a, it's just an integration constant anyway so it doesn't matter and it turns and you see the nice thing about this is that you've got the same expression beta zero g squared in both case places and um, this thing is a simpler form to analyze. And it's this form that they then inverted and got g of a is approximately beta 0 
log of a to the minus 2 lambda lat to the minus 2 plus beta 1 over beta 0 log log a to the minus 2 lambda to the minus 2. And all that to the minus 1 half. And so now we have a lattice analog of asymptotic freedom, namely, as a goes to 0, this thing goes to infinity, this goes to infinity, log log, creeps to infinity, log of infinity goes to infinity slowly, and 1 over that means that g goes to 0. So we have g of a goes to 0 as a goes to 0. And in as much as a is a distance, we can, with a little hand-waving, say, as energy goes to infinity. And this is what's called asymptotic freedom. So that's why they call this asymptotic freedom on the lattice, or the lattice analog of asymptotic freedom. Remember, last time, so somehow when I copied it last time, I had a lambda, and then I had here a lambda, and this was going to zero, this was going to minus infinity, and uh, that was not a pretty picture. Um, okay, so that straightens out the, the, the issue of complex G that was shown up last time. It's just that I didn't copy it. Okay, so so much for that. Now I thought that um, I would talk about the renormalization group in the continuum just because we've been talking about it here. And then we can slide back, if you want, and consider uh, lattice theory more generally, lattice gauge theory more generally, or lattice approximations more generally. It's, um, and I actually very recently had a new idea to use protein folding. Um, I'd be happy to share that with you. Uh, but let's, um, Let's look at the renormalization group in the continuum because it, I think it's crazy to talk about it in the last without talking about it. Okay, so let's recall that we did vacuum polarization last time. Q is this momentum going that way. And what we found was that pi of Q squared, this is after we use dimensional rigorization and so forth. We got this as e squared over 2 pi squared, integral 0 to 1, x 1 minus x, log 1 plus q squared x 1 minus x over m squared dx. Okay, um, so what's going on here? Well, Pi is dimensionless. And in fact, let's, um, let's imagine what we expect. We expect from dimensional analysis that pi of q squared, m squared, and e squared, which is what this thing is, since it's dimensionless, we should be able to write this as pi of 1, m squared over q squared, e squared. And then, if we were just doing dimensional, we didn't know what the answer was. If we were just doing dimensional analysis, we'd say, ah, as q squared goes to infinity, this should go to pi of 1, 0, e squared, which is a constant. That's what we'd say. But now we see that that behavior doesn't agree with the, the expression, this is to one loop, namely because there's a log of q squared over m squared. And as q squared goes to infinity, this log, well, it's only a log, so it can't do very much, but it grows. And um, this is called the problem of large logarithms. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Um, now, why did this occur? This, this, the, the root of the problem is one that um, it is that when we did this, we renormalized the theory at q squared equal to zero. So we renormalize at a fixed energy. The idea of the renormalization group is we normalize not at a fixed energy, but at, a, at an arbitrary energy. And then use the, if you use, if you're, compu if you're computing a process at energy E, use the renormalized coupling constant for that scale E, and then you'll get a better answer. You wouldn't have any large logarithms. And you see, the problem with large logarithms is, I mean, there's no problem to one loop. But there are other terms, the two loop term, the three loop term. They will also have large logarithms, maybe even larger logarithms. And um, so if you don't cope with the lo large logarithm problem, you're going to have um, you're going to have your, your, your expression to one loop won't be as good as it could be because it will be spoiled by all these long right. long. So that's, that's the problem. And um, uh, curiously, it's much simpler on the lattice to understand. I mean, it was, it was, it was transparent. But um, here, it's, I suppose, one of the reasons why it's less transparent is that you've got those damned infinities staring you right in the face, whereas when you're on the lattice, you never see any infinities. You can't get to the infinities because you can't have a zero. All right. <coughs> Let me speak more generally now. I'm following, by the way, Weinberg uh, chapter... 18. So this is volume 2. Um, so suppose gamma of E, X, G, and M. Suppose this is some physical parameter, some physical observable like pi. Uh, this is vacuum polarization, of course. Uh, Suppose it's some, something that we're calculating, and it, it needn't be a direct physical observable in the sense of being something real. It can be a complex amplitude, whatever. But suppose it has dimension d. Then dimensional analysis, the same thing that for a dimensionless pi, would tell us that this should go as e to the d gamma of 1 x. Oh, what's x? x is just angles, uh, whatever. There wasn't any x over here. Well, there was an x, but that was an integration variable. This x is, if it's a scattering amplitude, it's the cosine or something. And g, the coupling constant, and now m over e. And so once again, we'd expect that this should go to, Jesus. Every time I get to the punchline, I press harder and the jaw breaks. <laughs> Um, this should go to e to the 1 x g 0. In other words, it should behave just as e to the d. And the large logarithms get in the way of things. So the idea is to renormalize on a sliding scale g mu, which would be g of mu. Okay. Now what we'd be computing would be g gamma of e x G mu, M mu, and this is e to the d, gamma of 1 x G mu, M over e, mu over e. So now this is what, um, well, what we'd expect from dimensional analysis, and in fact, this is even, there's, there's nothing wrong with this statement, even when you do the conventional renormalization at a fixed energy scale. It's just that if you have a logarithm of m over e, when m over e goes to zero, the log doesn't go to zero, it goes to minus infinity. 
when it's oil seams. All right, now, so the idea here is to have, uh, is to compute gamma at mu equal to E. And in that case, this thing becomes uh, E to the D gamma of 1x g sub e, m over e, and 1. And the idea is to have g of e, so let me just write that down. So we want g of e to be independent of the ma m. m is the mass or masses in the theory, of course. Um, for E much bigger than M. And if that's the case, then, uh, then we're okay. And um, we can say, well, this thing goes to E to the D gamma of 1 x g e 0 and 1. Apart from, you know, maybe... What did we do when we went from mu over e to 1? We're, um, good question. We're, uh, we're deciding to use, to renormalize at the energy scale that we're interested in. And Mew was, uh, Mew was telling us about... In other words, we're, 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 we're computing something at energy scale E. In that case, you set Mu equal to E. Okay. That's the idea. And that was a... Sorry, I'm going so fast. Okay, so... So we've got this, um, so what is g of mu prime? We expect this to be some function g of g of mu, the ratio of mu prime over mu, and the ratio of m over mu. Okay. Now we're going to, the funny thing about this whole area of renormalization, there are, every now and then you have to do an integral but apart from the integral, occasional and occasional integral, the, um, the thing that you have to do is you have to think about unfamiliar things in unfamiliar ways, whereas the actual algebra and group theory and so forth isn't a problem. Since we're renormalizing yes. at a fixed energy, and then we're going to let that energy change, right? Right. We're, why, yes. why do we need this parameter mu? Mu is the scale at which we're renormalizing. And so then E... It's a sliding scale. Okay. And so whenever we need to compute something in energy E, we set mu equal to E. Okay. Let me actually give you an example. Um, when we did uh, dimensional renormalization, dimensional regularization, I should say, for... Uh, QED, we um, renormalized at uh, energy zero. Okay? We were doing, and that's and that gave us E squared such that uh, E squared over e, e squared H bar C over E squared over four pi H bar C was one over one hundred and thirty seven. Okay? Um, and that's the right value of E to use if you're doing low energy calculations. But if you're doing calculations at let energies, which was 90 jev on, no, I guess it was 45 jev on 45 jev, the number there I remember is the E squared you want to use is around 1 over 128. So it's bigger, and it's bigger because quantum electrodynamics is not asymptotic. Anyway, 
Now we're going to we want to see how this thing behaves, so we do g g mu prime d mu prime, and what is that going to be? That's going to be one over mu d d z of g of g mu z and m over mu at z equal to mu prime over mu. So the the one over mu comes from differentiating with respect to. In other words, it's d by dz times uh, 1 over mu, because we're differentiating the mu. OK. And that means that typo here. Well, not, not actually. It's Do not we have typo. to assume anything about how like, the functional form of g? Like, is, it, or is mu prime over mu only a polynomial or something? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. Let's, let's, let's not go there for the moment. Let's just stumble along and see what happens. We'll have an example in a minute. So let's cancel this mu by writing mu dg mu prime d mu prime is then d d z of g of g mu z m over mu. Again, z equal to mu prime over mu. Now we're going to set mu prime equal to mu. And we get a differential equation mu dg sub mu d mu, which is the beta function of g mu and m over mu, is then dg dz, and it's g of g mu z and m over mu at z equal to 1, because we're setting mu prime. Okay, so this is um, this is what we get just from a general general just logic, and now we're going to assume that for mu much greater than m, we can ignore this ratio here, and so we get mu dg mu d mu is beta of g mu and 0, which is what we call the beta function, beta of g mu. And this is the kalin semantic equation in the continuum. And uh, we can integrate this thing, because uh, what we have is dg over beta of g integrated from g sub m to g sub e. This almost looks like the Dow, uh, what the Dow looked like in years gone past from we integrate from General Motors to General Electric. Anyway, this is the integral from m to e of d mu over mu. And this is then log of e over m. So mu is the mu is like the cutoff. It sets the energy scale. Mu is the energy scale. So it sort of yeah. takes the place. And of, you're right. It is kind of like a cutoff. I mean, does it take the place of the lattice basin? I mean, are, are those two the similar ideas? Yeah, yeah. Except that mu is sort of one over a. Sure. And the whole idea of this renormalization is that effectively. We throw away the physics at energies higher than the cutoff, whatever it is, lambda, capital lambda frequently, or, or something. Or, anyway, let's go on with this. Get, now, now we're going to do an example. And um, examples are always And as you know, in physics, when whenever we need an example in quantum mechanics, we bring out, we drag out the harmonic oscillator. Mm -hmm. In quantum field theory, we drag out the uh, scalar field theory. Unfortunately, 
the harmonic oscillator, while the harmonic oscillator has lots of physical examples, as far as we've never seen a scale of particle. The Higgs is supposed to be scale, but we haven't seen it yet. Anyway, so this is minus a half uh, d lambda phi d lambda phi minus a half m squared phi squared uh, minus 1 over 24 g phi root 4. 24 being 4 factorial. The diagram for boson boson scattering are like that. P1, P2, P1, P2, P1 prime, P2 prime. So that's what we're thinking about. And um, if we did this, this would effectively give us G. Well, that's the G up there, the bare coupling. This would give us something proportional to G squared. And if you actually do the thing, you get to the scattering amplitude g minus g squared over 32 pi squared, integral 0, 1 dx. And here, instead of doing fancy dimensional regularization, which one needs to do in a gauge theory, we can just put in a brutal cutoff lambda. So this is natural log lambda squared over m squared minus sx, 1 minus x, plus natural log lambda squared over m squared minus s, wait a minute, what is this? t, 1 minus x, plus natural log lambda squared over m squared minus ux, 1 minus x, Minus three. Well, that's what it is. Lambda is an ultraviolet cutoff. S, T, and U are the Mandelstam variables, and uh, S is minus P one plus P two squared. The minus sign is because it's a Weinberg metric. T is minus P one minus P one prime squared. U is minus. 1 minus p2 times. And one of the nice things about the Mandelstam variables is that s plus t plus u is minus 4m squared if um, all pi squares are on the mass shell. That is to say, pi squared is minus m squared. But we can consider this amplitude for arbitrary. All right, let's look at the conventional approach. In the conventional approach, what we would do is we would say we're going to define G renormalize as simply the amplitude at, for example, S equal T equals U equals zero. Well, in that case, if you said S equal to zero, T equals zero, u equal to zero, these three terms can be combined and um, what you get is um, you get something with a lambda squared and then you get an integral zero to one of, um, oh, and you set them equal to zero so the x dependence is even gone, so this is really quite simple. And this means that this is equal to g minus 3 g squared, 3 because there are three terms here, over 32 pi squared times log of lambda squared over m squared minus 1. So that's what gr is. Um, let me just mention something here. And this is not in Weinberg. It just occurred to me as I was doing the thing. But watch carefully what I'm doing because the, the result I got surprised me and I want to, so I may have made a mistake. If we set this coefficient here, often the minus sign and the g squared 
set this whole thing equal to t. So in other words, let, oh, I called it t. It wasn't meant to be a Mandelstam t. So let me call it, um, I don't know, let's call it f. So let's say that f is 3 over 32 pi squared. So this is an aside, basically. Log of lambda squared over m squared minus 1. Then this equation relating gr to g is, uh, if we look on the right hand side, this is minus f g squared plus g minus gr equals 0. Okay? And that tells us, this is a quadratic equation, and that tells us that g is um, minus b, so that's uh, minus 1, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 1, minus, oh, all right, I did make a mistake, minus 4ac, and um, so this is minus 4 f g sub r over 2a, which is minus 2f. That's the way it is, right? Mm -hmm. OK. Now, um, this may work out on it anyway. So this is 1 over 2f minus or plus. Should that be positive in the root, because you have a negative leading coefficient? It's minus four AC. Oh, yeah, yeah, AC yeah. is C is negative. Sorry. All right. it, the question nonetheless deserves a candy. So, <laughs> ouch. So I'm moving in. I'm canceling the the minus sign. And I'm moving in a four F squared. So this is one over four F squared, and then minus uh, gr over f. So what's puzzling about this is that what this is saying is that g, in other words, f is this thing that's huge, right? So whatever gr is, suppose gr is a tenth. Then we take gr, we divide it by something you subtract. Uh, and we're subtracting from something that is, all right, so this whole thing is kind of the, 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 the somehow I, I made your, I made the same <laughs> mistake you made when I did this, and I got this to be a plus sign here, and so there's no problem. The problem then is that as f goes to infinity, this goes to zero, this becomes complex, and g um, becomes complex. All right, so I'll have to wipe that out anyways. In any event, um, what we do is we, setting gr equal to this, what we do is we replace a, or, or rather we can rewrite a as gr plus gr squared over 32 pi squared, integral 0 to 1, dx, and now we do have the three logs again, and it's 1 minus sx, 1 minus x over m squared plus log, 1 minus tx, 1 minus x over m squared plus log, 1 minus x, 1 minus x over m squared, and then um, that's it. <coughs> plus higher order terms, okay. So this um, is uh, what we get. And now, if we look at this amplitude in the limit of large st and u, we see we have the large logarithm problem. And this is because we renormalized at, um, at st and u equal to zero. All right, so what we're gonna do instead is we're going to define g mu 
as A of S equals T equals U equals minus mu squared. So that's going to be the change. Okay, so let me toss you a. Let's see, how, how many of you do I owe chalk to? Anybody else? Yeah, well, you spoke up. Speaking up is take one. <laughs> terms are the same, and what we get is... We're saying st and mu are really big negative numbers? Well, they're minus mu squared. This isn't a... a, a it, it, it's not a cutoff. It's a sliding scale at which we renormalize. Previously, we renormalized at stu equal to zero. Uh -huh. Now we're renormalizing at stu equal minus mu squared. But, so, are, are st and mu positive or negative? In this case, negative. Okay. Okay. Log of lambda squared over m squared plus mu squared x one minus x <coughs> minus one plus four g cubed. So that's this is our renormalization prescription. And then, uh, since that's g, uh, g uh, mu, um, why did we switch from switch back from the renormalized g to actually? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me see. I'm sorry, where, where, what are we talking about? Well, you wrote up the amplitude in terms of the renormalized g. But was that just to, was that just to write it? Because <laughs> now we switch back to where we're writing the amplitude in terms of... Okay, hold on, let me, let me, let me just... Let me in fact get my previous page of notes just so I put an awful lot of equations here. All right, so let's, let's back up just a little bit. We've got A as a function of the bare coupling is this. And then one way of renormalizing is to say G sub R is simply A at STU equal to zero. That's this expression. And um, if then uh, we replace this G here by G renormalized plus this thing, then the lambdas, the lambda divergences go away and um, what we get is this top expression. So this is the, this is the standard way of doing it, but it has large logs. All right. Now what we're doing is instead saying that this is our equation. And um, um, right, you know what? I think I've got the. Oh, oh, here we are. Yeah, no, no, no this is. No, I'm just wondering, did I? I think I skipped some.
Okay, yeah, I skipped something, but that's not, not all that important. Now what we're doing is setting this equal to that, and that in terms of the bare G is this, and um, now in terms of, so let me, let me go a couple of extra steps here. Uh, remember that G sub R was given by this expression here, and so we can say here that G sub mu is equal to G sub R plus 3 G sub R squared over 32 pi squared integral 0 to 1 dx log of 1 plus mu squared x 1 minus x over m squared uh, plus higher order terms. So that's, um, that's how g mu is related to gr. The trouble is that this um, is reasonable, that is to say, if gr is small, gr being the one at 0, then g mu is small only if um, if here uh, we need gr times this logarithm of mu over m is, is, is much less than 1. Okay. Now instead, let's, let's write things or write things this way. Let us write g mu prime is going to be g, I'm going back to the pair again, minus 3g squared over 32 pi squared, integral 0 to 1 dx. Um, and now I'm going to decompose this logarithm a little bit. This is log lambda squared minus log m squared plus the prime squared x one minus x minus one. And now g sub mu is the same thing. Ditto, I'll just say, mu squared. And so then we have g mu prime is equal to g mu minus three g mu squared over 32 pi squared integral zero to one dx log and now of m squared plus mu squared x one minus x over m squared plus mu prime squared x one minus x. Okay. And by the way, throughout all of this, um, when we have a finite we normalize coupling constant which we assume is small, we replace G mu by, in other words, we effectively um, replace G squared with G mu squared or G mu prime squared, um, thinking that the difference is a third order in these small coupling constants. Okay, now we can compute the beta function. So beta of g mu and m over mu is then mu prime g mu prime d mu prime well actually it's a mu here that's the way we did it um, so there's a typo there and mu prime equal to mu and now if we differentiate this expression with respect to mu prime just differentiating there and what we get is 3 g mu squared over 16 pi squared integral 0 to 1 dx. And now it's mu, and now we're setting mu equal to mu prime, or mu prime equal to mu, 1 minus x over m squared plus mu squared x, 1 minus x. All right, so that's what it is. And now we, and, and okay, all right, so that's, that's basically the expression. Um, if we now go to mu, much better, bigger than m, 
and this is just one, the integral of one from zero to one is one, and what we find then is the beta of g mu, which is beta of g mu uh, m over mu as um, for uh, mu much bigger than m. This then is just 3g mu squared over 16 pi squared. And um, if we had computed all this to two loops, what we would have had was 3g mu squared, uh, so this is one loop. 3g mu squared over 16 pi squared um, minus uh, 17 over 3 g mu g mu squared over 16 pi squared. Squared. What are, what are these extra terms? This is two loops. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. That's right. Okay, so that's our uh, beta function. And now um, we can see d mu over mu integrated from, say, m to e is then an integral of dg over beta. And if we use this simple form of it, this is an integral dg over 3g squared suppressing the mu, 16 pi squared. Okay. And uh, so that's 16 pi squared. I've run out of my notes. 16 pi squared over 3. Um, and so this is what? Minus 1 over g. The derivative of that is, OK, that's right. And we're evaluating this between m and uh, e. And um, so we get 16 pi squared over 3, um, 1 over g mu minus 1 over g e is a log of e over mu. And now exponentiating, we get e over mu get e over mu, well, he leaves it this way, actually. All right. So one just, in other words, what you've got is 1 over g mu minus 1 over g e is log e over mu uh, times 3 over 16 pi squared. And now, um, Effectively, if, if we're, wait a minute, did, oh, I had a mu, this is an m. Okay, we're integrating oh, yeah, d yeah. mu over mu from m, and that's what was yeah. really screwing me up here. This is an m. And um, so again, this is e over m, and this is g mu. And um, so effectively, did I do this integration? e over mu. g is a function of mu, right? So it seems like it should be from mu 1 to mu 2 or something. All right, all right. Here's what, here's what we're doing here. We're now. Oh, this is an M. Good. This is not an M. This is an M. All right. Now we're looking at this for big E. Okay. And we're going to basically ignore this term. And so that gives us G sub E at, as minus, um, we just invert this, 16 pi squared over 3 uh, log 
of um, E over M, or effectively now replacing it by mu, we get G sub mu is minus one over six, minus 16 pi squared over three log mu over M. And we get some more chalk. This is still only good for mu really much bigger than n? Or um, well, m is just an integration constant. Um, well, isn't m I mean isn't m the mass in the field there? Right, let me let me just let me just read it. So what's, what's, there's something worth looking at here. You see this mu is the scale, the sliding scale. And this is our dimensionless coupling constant. This gets replaced by a ratio of mu to this renormalization point, uh, or, or this, I should say, this parameter, m. And so what's happened is that this dimensionless coupling constant is effectively replaced by a dimension full parameter m. So what, what is m related to? How do we choose m? Um, I mean, m is not related to the mass in, in the theory? m, no, no, m is not related to the mass in the theory. Um, m is um, where we're integrating it's just the lower bound for this for this expression here, and uh, let's see. I, all right. Let me just uh, write down a couple more equations. One finds that G mu is effectively G R plus 3g r squared over 16 pi squared log mu over m. And if, if we say that, then what we can infer is that m is approximately m e to the 16 pi squared over 3g r. And um, so, it has so then this earlier equation isn't that maybe this mass? one? Oh, well, let, let me just get the let me let me get the final the final equation, then we'll be happy. We finally maybe find, maybe not. Yeah, is gr over one minus three gr over sixteen pi squared log mu over. Okay, so here's the point. The, this is the perturbative result. And so this thing has potentially a large log when mu is much bigger than m. On the other hand, we've gotten to this equation and now, even if, if mu is bigger than m, it's in the denominator, and we're OK. And so we still have something small here. Um, I'm, I'm confused as to how, how we got these two different results. All right, hold on a second. By the way, going from here to here is effectively um, um, I'm sorry, what, what's your question? We have these two expressions here. 
You said this this one is the perturbative. This one result. is perturbative. Perturbation is perturbative, yeah. And then this other one is from? This one is from this uh, renormalization group. Okay. And. But there's um, like a, but there's this running parameter mu in both of them? Yeah. Like I associate the running parameter with doing some sort of renormalization group. Well, it's well. To tell you the truth, I did not in preparing this lecture. I I was okay <laughs> to hear, and um, and then I I basically thought I would have time to read the rest of. Of the of Weinberg section here, but I just didn't get to. I just glanced at it, and just glancing at it, I'm I'm, I'm giving you what what I've done. I, I think, in other words, what I'll do. What day is today? Wednesday. Wednesday. All right. One day, we'll start here and go on and get it a little bit. But now these little straight. ends that we have are now the masses from the theory, right? The little ends of the masses. Okay. Yes. That sort of makes sense and because that's the only natural scale that you have, right? It's the only mass parameter. I mean, it's the only... The energy, the, there are two things. There's the energy scale at which you're... Right. At which you're uh, trying to uh, compute something. That's E. Mm -hmm. But that and just gets replaced by a mu. Right. So you get a better mu. answer if you said E equal to mu. Right. Um, but just from the, the theory, right? Just from the Lagrangian. And that is the only real scale that is set there. M, yeah, M is the scale, is a scale that's fixed. Those are the that's the mass of the gauge, of the gauge. Mass of the scale of boson in this theory. By the way, we can, we can look at this for a moment and, and uh, appreciate something. Namely, that this theory is not asymptotic. And the, the way we see that is that as we let mu increase, uh, mu over m becomes positive. And uh, when, if mu over m is, say, e to the capital N, then this thing is g mu is equal to gr over 1 minus 3gr over 16 pi squared times n. Okay. So then, uh, as n grows up, this thing is actually increasing. So g mu is increasing with n, till finally it goes to infinity. All right? Well, I mean, <laughs> I guess so. No, so you have to divide by gr. I well, guess. gr is we were yeah. assuming gr is small. No, but to see how this thing scales, I mean, like as I I look at the denominator, as n gets bigger, like isn't there a point where that thing becomes negative? Yeah. That's oh yeah, that's when it's crazy. But before becoming crazy, the th the, in other words, the coupling constant is this, um, where mu, of course, is the energy scale of the process. Okay. So if this is E equal to mu, um, and mu is equal to, from this formula, m times e to the n, mm -hmm. then this thing, which starts out at um, g sub r, goes up until finally it goes to infinity, and of course, long before, it, I mean, just, the point is that, that um, before it, I mean, GR is small. When it gets to something that's much bigger than GR, then uh, you know you can do perturbation theory. And this whole business is, mm. is wishy-washy. But what you can see is that if G sub R is like a tenth or, or a hundredth, then as you increase uh, mu or e, the thing goes up yeah. because of this, yeah. and so, so this is um, the opposite of asymptotic freedom. 
And this is also what happens in QED at low energies, before QED gets gets recombined with the weak interactions. Um, so, so let's see. Are there other questions that we can talk about before? Um, we've got about eight minutes left. Theory. Oh, well, I still have my question of what other observables are interesting to look at for for Zn. Pure Zn. Well, as I said, if you, go, if you let n go to infinity, it's U1, right. and you can compute the forces. If you had, um, if you also had U1, again, in the n to infinity limit, and um, you included other fields, for example, a charged scale particle mm -hmm. or a fermion. Now, once you put in a fermion, the calculation becomes very hard. But um, you could compute what the mass would be of that particle in the theory. And, um, of the scalar particle? Yeah. Or a fermion? Yeah. And um, so what are what are the interactions? Oh, and also also if um, I mean, another thing is you could compute the product of if, to go back to Zn. You could compute the product of the mean value, the product of two plaquettes at different at separated by a certain distance. One that's whether that's interesting, I don't really know. As I said, I've never worked in ZN. I think it is. I mean, depending on your boundary conditions, um, you can have interesting long-range correlations of the topological nature. Between the, yeah. you mean between? Oh, uh, yeah. Two plaquettes? Yeah. I think so. Well, it's something you can compute in any case. All right, why don't we just wait? Oh, no, actually, no. What happens is they decay exponentially the farther out you go. But there is some, there is still some. Uh, Which, what decays? Like the two point correlation, the farther away it gets. So? I think. So you're saying trace of the U's around the little square. Yeah. Times. Trace of the u primes around another little square, <clears throat> okay. and um, separated by a distance. I think that's going to decay exponentially with the distance. Okay, but you want to subtract something, right? Because this thing has some mean value anyway. Uh huh. Right, because it's whatever the thing is that we coupling. In fact, you computed it. Mm -hmm. Um, so you subtract, um, you might subtract the value at weak coupling or some other coupling. Or just you, sub you might subtract, well I don't know what you subtract, but anyway, whatever you subtract, um, something like a, a trace of u, trace of u squared, um, you're saying that that thing decays exponentially. I think so. All right, and so that would be the analog of computing the mass of an equivalent. But in a, I mean, how does that make sense in a pure gauge theory? In a pure gauge theory? Yeah, because there's only gauge elements here. There's right. No, there's no scalar. Theory. So you're saying, what if you computed, um, if you're in, say, QCD? Well, sure, I guess. Or just a simple scalar, just a scalar theory where you have another scalar field. 
I, I have to think. Well, if it's just just scalar fields, no gauge. No fields scalar or and gauge fields. All right. Well, let, let's just look at the pure gauge field. Then. So then you're saying you compute. Oh, you're saying this becomes the mass of the gauge field. Oh, actually, this might be a blue ball. Well, the idea is that you, you might have gluons form a colorless combination. And that colorless combination might have a mass. But wouldn't you need a, I mean, don't you need an SU3 gauge theory for that? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm talking about that. <laughs> or SU2. Um, so this, 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 this might be a blue ball type thing. All right, why don't we quit?